Welcome, everyone. I want to uh, introduce a series of lectures today on thinking about asymptotics and perturbations for differential equations. And one of the places we're going to start is with a classical phase plane analysis, which many people are uh, somewhat aware of and have done before. But a lot of the concepts we want to introduce are really sitting there in, in those kind of simple models of two by two differential equations. So this is the, uh, the, the main focus of today is think about reviewing what the phase plane analysis does of nonlinear dynamics in the first couple of lectures. All the notes, by the way, can be found on the archive. Uh, for this course. So let's start off with a simple review of two by two differential equations that are linear and constant coefficient. So the easiest way to write that down is x prime equals ax, where a is a two by two matrix. And there's only certain things that can happen in such a simple system. So it's two by two, and in fact we have analytic solution techniques available to us, which can be found typically towards the back of most differential equations books, uh, thinking about systems of first order differential equations. In fact, second order differential equations can always be written as a, a system of two first order differential equations. And so this is the generic representation of what we want to consider in terms of looking at dynamics and the idea of a phase plane. So we're going to introduce some concepts. In particular, we're going to look at this thing and start thinking about one of the important classes of solutions or, or what are called the equilibrium points. We look at when does x prime equal to zero. In other words, when x prime is equal to zero, nothing's happening. Nothing's changing in time. So this is very much like when you look for derivatives being equal to zero, which are min and max. x prime equals zero are often called the equilibrium points. In other words, where the dynamics is not changing. So x prime equals to 0 is where this happens. And there's only one spot this happens for linear systems, and that is at the origin. So you put x prime equals to 0, which means ax equals to 0. And so then your solution is x equals to 0, unless, of course, a is uh, singular. But we're, we're, not at, we're looking at currently non-singular matrices. And so we want to think about that. Um, and in those cases, non-singular matrices A, then in fact, uh, the only equilibrium point is the origin. And this is going to be part of what we focus on is what is behavior near the origin, um, which is the equilibrium point uh, of this system. OK, so what are the possibilities and how are we going to go solve this system? So, What's standard to do in linear differential equations is to look for solutions that are exponentials. So that's just the, the common thing that happens in looking for solutions to differential equations. Linear systems, you try an exponential. V equals e to lambda t. So you know what lambda is, you know what v is. And so the question is, if I put in this kind of form of solution, how do I find that v and that lambda that can tell me something about this? types of solutions I would get out of this two by two system. If you plug that in, what you end up with into the x dot equals ax, you end up with a eigenvalue problem, which is given right by here. a minus lambda i, v equals to 0. And so what you can see right away is, if I want to solve this equation, I can look here at this a minus lambda i. And if this actually has an inverse, then you can take the inverse and you'll find v equals 0. And v equals 0 is not a very interesting solution. It's the trivial solution. And I want to find non-trivial solutions to this problem. Another possibility is to pick the lambda to make this a minus lambda i singular. And in that case, there is the possibility of being able to write down solutions. And in fact, those values that make that a minus lambda i singular are called the eigenvalues. And the corresponding v are called the eigenvectors. OK, so this is just an eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition by trying exponential solutions to this linear differential equation. And that's the standard thing you would do with any linear differential equation is just try an exponential solution. Okay? And by the way, the exponential solution isn't just, uh, depending upon what lambda is, if it's real or imaginary, you can get very different types of behavior, whether it's growth or decay or oscillations. And in fact, this form of solution, there's only, unless the eigenvalues are purely imaginary, all the solutions are either going to go to infinity or go to zero, okay? Unless you have purely imaginary 
lambda values. So that's something to keep in mind as you start thinking about the types of solutions you want to get out of this. So the eigenvalues, eigenvectors of the matrix A are going to determine all of the behavior for us in these systems. And so it's important to calculate those. So, and in fact, what I really want to do is I'm assuming you know how to calculate eigenvectors and eigenvalues of a 2 by 2 system. But what I really want to do is highlight the different types of behaviors you can get in this system. And there's five canonical cases, and I want to walk through those because in many ways they're going to set up the basis for us to understand a much uh, richer set of dynamics when we go to nonlinear systems because nonlinear systems are going to be made out of components out of the linear systems. At least our qualitative understanding of that will happen through linear systems. So let's look at this. Case one, the eigenvalues are real, unequal, and of the same sign. So they can both be positive or both be negatives. Okay? And if we have that, what we can find is for each one of those eigenvalues, there is a corresponding eigenvector. So generically, our solution is going to look something like this. It's going to be a linear combination. So since it's a linear system, we can rely on linear superposition for this uh, solution type, which is one solution here, v1, eigenvector v1 times e to lambda 1t, the solution v2, e to lambda 2t. So you just Add these together, you can determine C1 and C2 based upon the initial conditions of your problem. And, uh, and then you can uh, analyze the solution. Now, notice that what, depending on lambda 1 and lambda 2, if they're both real and positive, right, then the solutions are going to blow up exponentially. If they're both real and negative, then the solutions are going to go to zero. Okay? And the generic way to construct the, what this solution looks like is to draw something like this. This is called the phase plane for this node or source sink. So what I've shown you here is when the two eigenvalues are real and negative. So the bolded lines are, let's say, the directions of the v1 and v2. In other words, the two eigenvector directions. And along those eigenvector directions, you have a decay of lambda 1 and a decay of lambda 2. And so you generically get this kind of structure here, which is everything is going to the origin, and it's going faster along one direction than the other. In fact, it's going faster depending upon which one is lambda, is lambda 1 bigger than lambda 2 or vice versa. The biggest one tells you the fastest decay rate. So it's decaying more quickly along one direction than another, and then you get this kind of structure here. Okay? What I've drawn here is a sink. All the solutions go to zero. If the eigenvalues were both positive, all those arrows would reverse their direction. Everything would be going out to infinity, and that would be called a source. So again, this is the canonical uh, picture for uh, the eigenvalues and eigenvector system when the two eigenvalues are both real and of the same sign. So that's case one. Case two is we can again consider real eigenvalues, but this time the eigenvalues are opposite sign. One is positive, one is negative. So the generic solution type is going to look something like this. Lambda 1t, e to the minus lambda 2t. So this is going to be our solution type right here. Okay? And you can see one of them, let's say that if lambda 1 is positive, then this one here is growing exponentially, so the solutions go to infinity. While this one here, if lambda 2 is positive, then the solutions are decaying and going to zero. So you have one stable direction, which is along this eigenvector here, and you have an unstable direction along here. What I mean by stable or unstable is do solutions go to zero or do solutions go to infinity? All those solutions that go to infinity, they blow up. Those are the unstable solutions. And all the solutions that go to zero are the stable. So that's the generic structure. And this is kind of what the, the sort of prototype look of case two looks like. It's called a saddle. In other words, you have directions here. And what I've drawn here is along these two directions right here, right here, these are the eigenvectors that are decaying exponentially in towards the origin. And along these directions here is them exponentially growing away from the origin. Okay? So you come in along one direction and go out along another. This saddle structure is a very important structure. It shows up in many systems. And in fact, it's a sort of a canonical, interesting case of 
of dynamics that get attracted near a point and then go off, uh, fly away from that point. Um, and that's the state, uh, saddle. And the saddle is considered unstable because all the solutions eventually move away from it. Even though initially they might come toward that uh, fixed point or the equilibrium point, eventually they get ejected out towards infinity. So that's case two. Case three is, again, the last case we're going to consider with real eigenvalues. But suppose those two eigenvalues are, in fact, identical. In other words, it's a double root. So you find these eigenvalues, and you get a double root. And double roots or uh, you know, multiple roots of a system are very interesting. We won't talk about them too much right now. But it does give you two possibilities. One possibility is that when you find this double root, you actually go back to find your eigenvectors. And you find two distinct eigenvectors. So for a single eigenvalue, you'd get a v1 and you'd get a v2. This is called a proper node or a star. In other words, there's no preferential di direction either as a source or a sink in which the, the, the dynamics is flowing faster. And so you just have these two directions, and you get this with, like I said, proper node or a star. However, often is the case that you cannot find two linearly in two different v1 and v2. Okay, And so what you're going to have to do is find what's called a generalized eigenvector or an improper node. And the improper node is very much takes on the form of the first eigenvector. So here's the first eigenvector v1 along the e to lambda 1 t direction. But the improper node tends to give you a solution that where you have t e to the lambda 1 t. So it picks up this polynomial expression in front of this eigenvector. And in fact, if you had a, multi a higher multiplicity, of eigenvalues. In other words, if you were in a higher uh, order system of linear first order equations, and you say you had a triple root, you might have a t squared e to the lambda 1t and so forth, plus some generic vector eta e to the lambda 1t. So this is now what's called a generalized eigenvector for this double root case. And so there's two, those are the two possibilities you have when you have uh, double roots or multiple roots in general is that you have to dis decide if it's a proper node or an improper node. Okay? And this is what these look like. In the proper node case, you have these two different eigenvector directions, v1 and v2, represented here. But since everything's either growing in the same direction or decaying in the same direction, it just looks like a star. Everything is equal direction. Everything goes out, flows out of that uh, uh, equilibrium point or comes into the equilibrium point uh, at the, uh, the same speed in every direction. <coughs> in, case, in, the, in case of an improper node, you find this generalized eigenvector in which look at your structure of your eigenvectors. They actually have shapes to them. They're not just straight lines. So this, this main line here is the one eigenvector that you have. And this one here is this generalized eigenvector, which we computed uh, previously. So those are the possibilities you have when you have double roots. We now move on to the case when you have complex eigenvalues. In other words, eigenvalues that have uh, imaginary components. Okay, so. Uh, this would just come from solving for your eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And the way you do it for a 2 by 2 system, you're actually solving a quadratic equation. And that quadratic equation can produce imaginary uh, components to the eigenvalues. So these complex eigenvalues have a structure like this. There's a real part and a complex conjugate pair of plus or minus i mu. So the real part is beta, and mu is the complex piece to this. Now beta determines whether the solutions are going to grow to infinity or decay to 0. So if beta is positive, this is the real component. Remember, it's e to the lambda t. So this is all being exponentiated to this real part. And the real part tells you whether you're going to get growing or decaying. The e to the i mu t. By using an Euler formula, you know that's related to cosines and sines. So the I mu is oscillations at a frequency omega. Or sorry, at a frequency mu. 
So those, the imaginary part of the eigenvalue tells you something about the oscillation. <coughs> the real part tells you about growth or decay. So in general, it's going to look something like this, a spiral node. So you're going to be oscillating and growing in this case here. And so as you're oscillating and growing, you spiral out away from your equilibrium point. However, if beta was negative, then you'd spiral in to the origin. Okay, so those are spiral node. It's either stable or unstable, depending upon the sign of the real part. That determines everything in terms of its stability. The final case, as you might have guessed, is going to be, again, eigenvalues that are imaginary, but now they're purely imaginary. In other words, the real part is zero, which means you have no growth, no decay. What do these look like? Well, the eigenvalues look like this, plus or minus i mu, so you still come in complex conjugate pairs. So you have two eigenvalues because it's a two by two system. They're complex conjugate pairs of each other. And this is going to be e to the i mu t and e to the minus i mu t, which you can express instead in terms of cosine mu t, sine mu t. So these are going to just be pure oscillations. And cosines and sines are, are one of our few functions that as you go to infinity or minus infinity, uh, they're always bounded between 1 and minus 1. And so you get something like this, case 5, which is a center node. And the center node here, is just basically oscillations around that equilibrium point. So it's neutrally stable. It's not growing or decaying. And these often play an interesting role because small perturbations to this can destroy your, your neutral stability, which is represented here in this picture. So those are the five canonical cases. And one of the reasons we're going to highlight this, at least the in initially for this class, is because uh, once we understand these five pieces, everything we're going to do in terms of start looking at nonlinear system is going to be framed locally in terms of these five behaviors, uh, which are linear behaviors around equilibrium points. And so that's going to be the main thrust of us to try to understand is these five cases are going to keep showing up repeatedly in our, in our uh, efforts to try to analyze nonlinear dynamic systems. Okay, so now we're going to move on and start thinking about, okay, so this phase plane analysis comes in these canonical behaviors. There's five possible behaviors. That's for these linear systems. And when we do our local analysis around equilibrium points, those five behaviors are going to be the prototypes for determining everything that happens in a system. And the way you understand these five behaviors is these eigenvalues. So you find these eigenvalues, and that will give you the qualitative behavior near the fixed points. Whether you're growing, decaying, spiraling, these kind of different behaviors can all be deduced from the eigenvalues. The eigenvectors tell you specifically which directions in which these behaviors are happening, and um, ultimately the stability is determined just by looking at the real part of the exponential. Okay? And so that tells you if you're going to go to infinity or go to zero. And those are the only possibilities once you have exponential solutions, unless you have purely imaginary eigenvalues in which you'll just oscillate for all time. So this is an important uh, start to understanding concepts around equilibrium and stability, and it's all framed around these five cases that I just reviewed for you here. So where I want to take this is start to come to understanding the pendulum. And in particular, a lot of us have studied the pendulum, but typically we, we study the linearized version of the pendulum, right? We look at the low amplitude or the low, uh, uh, the low oscillation limit, and then we can write down a much simpler equation. But we want to come here, draw this fourth body diagram, think about the variable theta characterizing this pendulum. And what we want to do with it is write down the governing equations, which are nonlinear and start to understand the pendulum in a deeper way through this phase plane analysis. Okay? Not just the linear pendulum when it's with small angle approximation. So here are the governing equations. This is just F equals ma, free body diagram. What you have here is mass times acceleration here. 
you have here a, uh, let's say, uh, some kind of wind resistance, which is, which is proportional to the, the velocity of the d theta dt, in other words, how fast it's swinging. And then you have the force of gravity right here. There's the g right there, and it depends upon the length of the pendulum and so forth. So this is a, a classic equation, very old. And I can rescale everything to make it a little simpler to just write it in this form right here. So it's a second order differential equation. It's nonlinear. It's constant coefficient. And uh, so this is a fascinating equation because the, the, the behaviors out of this uh, are, are quite remarkable and interesting, especially when you start to force this system. Uh, and we will do that later as we go through the class. But for right now, we're just going to consider this base case uh, where there's no forcing. And here's how we write it. The nonlinearity is right there, the sine theta. And typically, if you've studied the pendulum before in many uh, mechanics courses or beginning physics courses, you say that sine theta is approximately theta. That makes it linear. And linear equations are much easier to solve than nonlinear equations. Nonlinearity is what makes uh, so much of life very interesting. So I want to throw that out there because that's what this course is all about, uh, is thinking about nonlinearity both in terms of time-dependent problems as in boundary value problems, where we no longer can write down analytic solutions, but we want to make use of the fact that for linear systems that are close to it, we can write down solutions. So everything's going to be about perturbations and approximations. And we want to understand these basic cases first as we build intuition towards this. So the first thing we do is we take that differential equation, second order, and we write it as a system of first order equations. So you set x is equal to theta, y is equal to d theta dt, and now you have this x dot y dot is equal to this here. So now what I have is a two by two nonlinear system of equations. And the things that I want to start to look at is exactly where I started with before, which is what are the equilibrium points and what are their stability? Those are the two key concepts we want to consider. So let's start off with the simplest case, or simpler case, which is the pendulum with no damping. So in that case, the system reduces to here. So I've taken out the damping term, so I get x dot equals y, y dot equals minus omega squared sine x. So it's still not linear. I got that sine x floating around in there. But then I can start asking, when do I have equilibrium points? Now equilibrium points are when the solution is at rest. In other words, x dot is equal to 0, y dot is equal to 0. Well, it's pretty easy to see x dot's going to be 0 when y is 0. Okay? And y dot is going to be equal to 0 when this is equal to 0. In other words, when sine x is equal to 0. Now, sine x is 0 for any value of n pi. For, so I have actually an infinite number of fixed point equilibrium solutions. And what do these correspond to, these n pi and the 0? Well, the 0 corresponds to the fact that, remember, that y was equal to theta dot. In other words, there is no angular veloc uh, velocity to this uh, pendulum swinging around. And x equals n pi. 0 pi is when it's facing straight down. And 0 pi, 2 pi, 4 pi, or the negatives of those. And pi, 3 pi, 5 pi is when it's in the upright positions. These two positions are special. They're equilibrium points. And right away, you know that when it's in the down position, if you perturb it a little bit, it's going to be stable. Right? Because, in fact, if you perturb it a little bit, this pendulum will stay down here, will be, remain down here. While in the upright position, the pendulum, if you perturb it a little bit, we know that it will fall over. And so the upright position, we already know, should be unstable. The question is, how do we actually quantify that understanding of the pendulum? So we have to start looking at these equilibrium points as a start point, and the equilibrium points already tell us something very important. These are the very special points that we have to think about in this nonlinear system where nothing is happening, where the dynamics is not moving, are these points. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to start looking near these points and taking this nonlinear system with an infinite number of fixed points, equilibrium points and start looking at each one individually and look at a linear approximation near each. Remember, the linear system only has a single fixed point. 
So here's how we do it. We linearize about the equilibrium. In fact, this is exactly what you did perhaps in your beginning physics course. You took that sine x and you, and you made it approximately x. And then we solve the linear pendulum. Okay? You, so in many times, most people are familiar with the fact that you've already made a linear approximation to this problem. So here's how we're going to do it here. We're going to say x is equal to near one of these equilibrium points plus x tilde. And y is going to be 0 plus y tilde. And the idea here is that x tilde and y tilde are both going to be very small. So they're going to be perturbations. So we're going to be very near the equilibrium points. Okay? And by being very near the equilibrium points, we're going to make use of, the, of, of asymptotics and perturbations to get us approximate solutions. So let's start off with uh, the first piece of asymptotics you probably have already used. And this is exactly what we did previously with the pendulum, is if you say, if I'm going to expand, here's this sine, and I'm expanding this x around this equilibrium point, so it's plus or minus m pi plus x tilde. Here it is. Well, if I do this around n equals 0, so I'll just throw n equals 0 down here, so then I have sine of x tilde, and then I can just Taylor expand this. So I'm, not, I'm just, just going to do a standard Taylor expansion of the sine function, and there it is. But notice what happens when I do a standard expansion. Sine x tilde is equal to x tilde minus x tilde cubed. Now suppose that x tilde is small, like 10 to the minus 2. Then the first term is 10 to the minus 2, x tilde cubed is like 10 to the minus 6. And this, x tilde to the 5, is like x to the minus 10. So you can see these are much smaller than the x tilde. So often what we do is then we say, well, then I can approximate this whole thing just with x tilde. And this is exactly what we did when we first considered the pendulum in a physics course. As we said, sine x tilde is about x tilde. And then we've had a linear pendulum. And this is why people think they can solve the pendulum. Well, it's an easy problem. When you have the nonlinearity in there, it's not so easy. Okay, <coughs> But that's the whole basis of approximation that we want to be using here. So if we actually take that approximation and put that back in, so sine x tilde is equal to approximately x tilde, then that 2 by 2 linear, uh, nonlinear system of equations becomes a linear system of equations. And here it is, where x here, this is the bold x, which is the two components, little x, uh, x and y, which are the theta and theta dot. And so you get this 2 by 2 system of equations. And we've already talked about this as, well, all I have to do is find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this. And then I have, and it's going to fit into one of the five forms that we talked about. So this is near the origin. So remember, we did expansion with the pendulum in the down position. Here is our linear system approximation. And if you do your eigenvalues, comp compute your eigenvalues, what you find is the eigenvalues give you a center. In other words, the eigenvalues are purely imaginary. So if you're now, remember, we did this. This is the approximation we did. We're near the bottom of the pendulum swing. There is no. Uh, frictional forces. It's just no damping. So if you start it oscillating, what this tell you is that the eigenvalues tell you that the, uh, are purely imaginary, which means, in other words, the solution is periodic forever. So it never will stop swinging, which, of course, once you have a little damping, you'll go to zero. But uh, initially, uh, at least in this limit with no damping, if you start swinging this thing, it will swing with a frequency omega, and it will not stop. So we can compute, uh, so that's, and that's more broadly uh, how we would consider the system is like near that down pendulum. By the way, the down pendulum and also 2 pi multiples of it are the same thing. So 2 pi multiples is back in the down position, and those eigenvalues are purely imaginary always in that position. We can also look at it when it's in the up position. So now we're going to linearize about the equilibrium plus or minus 2 pi. In other words, I'm at the bottom of the swing. 2 pi plus pi. So I'm going to put myself right at the top. That's what that plus pi does. So now I'm going to take that value and add a little perturbation to it. And then y is still perturbed around 0. So uh, 
recall from the Taylor expansions around zero, we, we were able to Taylor expand, and now we're going to do it again, but we're going to Taylor expand this or look at, uh, do some, a little bit of fancy, uh, you know, some of our trig rules. We're going to now expand this thing. So here's your plus or minus n2 pi plus pi and x tilde. But you can basically, this 2n pi does not matter. In fact, it's just 2 pi shift, which tells you that this is equal to sine pi plus x tilde, which now if you use this trig relationship of sine cosine plus cosine sine, you find yourself in a situation which this is equal to now negative sine x tilde, which is equal to negative x tilde when you do your Taylor approximation. So remember, we had at the bottom, sine x tilde was equal to x tilde. At the top, the sine of x tilde is equal to minus x tilde. So it's a sign switch. And the sign switch is going to make all the difference in the behaviors. So now your linearized system is given by this. And the only difference from before is that before we had a minus sign here, and now we don't. Now you can compute your eigenvalues. And now the eigenvalues are purely real, and they're opposite sign. One's omega, one's minus omega. Here they are. So this is a saddle. There's one unstable direction and one stable direction. Okay? So that's going to tell us something very interesting, right? So when you're at the top of this pendulum, or when the pendulum's in the upright position, you come up to it, that's the stable direction, but then you fall away on either side, and that's the unstable direction. Okay? So this is exactly what this is telling you. So you can get drawn into this fixed point, but then you eventually go away from it. And here are the eigenvectors. And the eigenvectors for this are actually pretty nice, to, easy to calculate. You can count, calculate the in, eigenvector for the omega case. So you put back, back, back into a minus lambda i x. Put that in, what your eigenvalue is. Work this thing out. One of the eigenvectors is in direction 1 over omega. The other eigenvector is in the direction 1 minus omega. Okay, so you have your two eigenvectors. You can compute their directions for the stable and unstable directions around each of the fixed points in the upright position of the pendulum. So here's what it kind of looks like. Remember, all of this was based upon perturbations. So here's, remember, I have an infinite number of equilibrium points. And notice that what I've drawn here is that at zero, in other words, the Per, uh, the equilibrium point at zero or multiples of two pi of it, what I found was that the behavior had purely imaginary eigenvalues. So what you see here is these things are centers. There they are, just rotating around, which is exactly what you expect. In other words, it's in this position, and there's no damping, it will just oscillate forever. Whereas in the upright position and two pi's of that, that's what these guys are here, here and here, 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 they're saddles. So you have a direction in and a direction out. So all of this is a local analysis around each one of these points. The perturbation theory, remember, relies on this being an approximation. So what I've shown you here is the local analysis in summary. So this is what the behavior looks like for all these fixed points. Now what what we normally do, this, this analysis, because once we understand the fixed points and we understand their stability, we actually understand everything qualitatively that can happen in this system. In particular, if this is what happens on a local level, <coughs> the only thing that can happen on a global level is something like this. So these fixed points like this, <coughs> and the only way for this to be self-consistent is the unstable direction of this guy ends up in the stable direction of that guy. <coughs> so this is corresponding to when this goes from here, goes in the unstable direction, comes around, and ends up back up here at the top. And that's exactly what these, what are called heteroclinic orbits, tell us, these trajectories. What these solutions are up here is if you're rotating this thing and it just keeps going around and around and around. Remember, it's not damped. So it just keeps going right by the fixed points, which are this direction and this direction. It just keeps rotating forever. And then if you're in here between negative pi and pi, then you're just si simply oscillating inside this pendulum like this. So this is a qualitative depiction of the dynamics. 
based upon your approximations of linear dynamics near each of the fixed points. In other words, your perturbation analysis around each of the fixed points allows us to draw this qualitative picture, and this is global. If you want, if you actually want quantitative analysis, then you could do, just go to recourse to numerical simulations, for instance, right? And then you can run these simulations. And you can also write down solutions for the pendulum in terms of uh, Jacobi elliptic functions. Okay, what about with damping? We'll finish this off. We'll bring the damping back in. So that when you have damping, you bring this term back in, this minus gamma y, and you say, what are the fixed points now? Well, the fixed points are identical to the, what they were before. In other words, to make x prime equal to 0, you have to have y equal to 0, which means this is y equals 0 here, y equals 0 here. To make y prime 0, then you have to make sine x equal to 0, which is plus or minus m pi. Same thing as before. We have an infinite number of fixed points, and they're at the same locations as without damping. And so there they are. There's the equilibrium point. So I have everything the same except for now, when you're going to compute your eigenvalues, the presence of this damping term is going to change the eigenvalues. So here we go. If I linearize about the equilibrium, just like we did before, so a, a perturbation, so we're going to basically do a little local analysis around each of the different fixed points. <clears throat> and if you linearize around the down position, Here's what now the 2 by 2 system looks like. So now the only difference here is I've, I've picked up this off diagonal term, minus gamma here. And when you compute the eigenvalues of this, here they are. The eigenvalues have an imaginary component there, right over on the right there, and this damping term, minus gamma over 2. So the real part is negative, in, is negative so it's going to be damped. And it's going to be oscillating at that frequency right there. So in other words, it's exactly what you expect. If you start this pendulum off, it's going to slowly die down and end up at the fixed point, which is the down position. So this is the eigenvalues for all of the down positions. And if you do the same thing for the up positions, the only change here was that now, remember this, minus, this was a minus sign, now it's a plus sign. The eigenvalues are given by here, which now this is square root of some positive quantity. And so there's no imaginary component. And in fact, you can find that one of the eigenvalues is positive, one of the eigenvalues is negative. That's pretty easy to see right here, right? Because you're taking the square root of omega squared plus gamma squared over 4. So this is bigger than this here, and it's plus or minus. So you have a stable and unstable direction. That's your canonical saddle. And your picture gets modified to this here. Okay? <clears throat> so now, again, you have a saddle here. And in fact, here, in every 2 pi from it, this is the up position. And then you have here, these are your stable spirals. So in other words, if you start the pendulum from the upright position, it will never get back up to the full upright position because you have damping. So instead, you come down, you get some damping, and now you just oscillate right into the fixed point. And that's exactly what these trajectories are representing. And if you really whip this thing around, so it goes around several times, and then eventually it stops and oscillates down to the bottom, that's what some of these trajectories up here represent. So in other words, here, this one here comes down, comes down, oscillates twice around, and then eventually it's going to get sucked in to one of these orbits. So this is our global understanding of the damped nonlinear pendulum by doing local linear analysis and relying on approximations and perturbations to give us all the information we need to construct this picture of what the solution looks like. The quantitative trajectories, like I said, you can just run this through simulation, but you already know everything that's going to happen qualitatively. And this is exactly what we're going after in many of the approximations that we're trying to make for this course, is we want to start thinking about how do I capitalize on all this local information to get me information on a uh, global level so I can understand the problem very well. So here's the summary. The phase plane analysis of these nonlinear dynamics is we're going after a global analysis that is qualitative by understanding the local behavior 
and we can do most of this just from computing the eigenvalues of the local linear behavior. And once we have those computed, we understand the entire global behavior of the system. And I've shown you this just for this pendulum problem, and hopefully that will help you also understand the pendulum in a little higher level if the only thing you've ever looked at is the pendulum in the linear approximation limit. So now you understand how we got that linear approximation, but you understand that actually there's a lot more to the pendulum than that linear approximation, and this kind of highlights that all for you. So we'll stop there, and uh, we'll keep building on these themes. Approximations, approximations, perturbations. How do I use, how do I solve nonlinear equations using linear information, and this is what we're after.